Africa's key economies are in the spotlight today. A report released this week by the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa forecasts that African nations will dominate the world's top 10 fastest growing economies in 2024 and 2025. According to the report, the economy in the continent is projected to expand from 2.8% in 2023 to 3.5% this year and further to 4.1 in 2025, primarily supported by net exports, private consumption and gross fixed investment. However, Africa's economic progress is characterized by instability in many parts and remains below its potential. The situation does call for significant adjustments in fiscal and monetary policies, along with enhanced measures to rectify internal and external imbalances, tackle inflation and debt challenges. But earlier this year, Countries like the Ivory Coast, the Republic of Benin and Kenya went to international bond markets with issuances oversubscribed, signaling investor appetite for these frontier markets. To help us catch up on some of the big themes in African economies, I'm joined live from Cairo by Dr. Yemi Kale, Group Chief Economist and Managing Director for Research and International Corporation at Afrexim Bank. He was previously Chief Economist at KPMG West Africa and Statistician General of Nigeria, as well as CEO of the Nigerian Bureau of Statistics. Welcome to the show, Dr. Kale. Great to have you on. Well, okay, thanks for, for inviting me. Yes, thank you. So first, I want to ask you, which countries are on your watch list uh, to be the biggest growth drivers in 2024 and why? Well, I think um, most of them are coming from the East African uh, region. Uh, for example, Kenya, some of the ones that are growing, the, I'm expected to grow the fastest. I don't necessarily the biggest con um, countries in Africa because uh, of their size. But in terms of growth, we are looking, like you said, uh, we are looking at um, um, Kenya. We expect Kenya to do very well. Uh, we're also looking at, based on the re recent reforms uh, in Egypt, we also expect Egypt to also do very, very well. So mo most countries in West Africa, most countries in East Africa, I think are going to dominate growth in 2024. Yes, indeed. And it's an interesting, you know, I was going to ask you about the quality of that growth. Is it still primarily, I mean, some of these economies, are we seeing diversification? Is it still primarily export driven or is it really a mishmash of trends? I think it's a mixture of both. Uh, uh, private consumption is still very, is very is still in the continent uh, and exports are beginning to to grow stronger following the, um, the the return of growth following the um, COVID-19 pandemic. But household consumption expenditure, particularly services consumption, is expected to drive growth in Africa. If you look at the structure of most African countries, you see that it's driven lightly by uh, the services sector. Uh, so export of services, consumption of services and exports of primary uh, raw materials is expected to drive growth in 2024. Uh, yes, uh, also we have to take into account base effects. The the small the smaller countries tend to grow much much faster than the the bigger ones like the South Africa's Nigeria and Egypt. But in terms of impact, if you are looking at it in terms of the overall African impact, you still expect those sm the small smaller growth expected in the bigger countries to be more uh, to have more of an impact as far as overall African growth is concerned. Yes, uh, very good point, Dr. Kala. And interesting, I was looking at the table that was produced by the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, and I saw that Niger is tipped to grow by 11.2%, and giving some of the concerns around stability and governance there, well, it's, it's not by any means unique to Niger. You know, I'm wondering, is that primarily because of its, one of its natural resources, uranium exports? You know, that type of growth we see in Africa, despite prevailing, uh, you know, political economic circumstances, what do you have to say to those forecasts for countries like Niger, which is predicted to grow at 11.2%. Well, yeah. Well, political instability, it's, it, I guess it depends on how you look at it. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, political instability does not affect um, the way we do business on the continent. Yeah. Um, since most of the time, African countries are exporting raw materials that are needed for the production process in many other countries in the more developed countries, um, the instability or perceived political instability in those countries is not going to stop that process. They're still going to be demanding these raw materials from African countries. They're going to find ways of doing business with the, whichever African leader it is. The, the, Depend, the, despite the political instability that might be going on in the country, 
um, and, and, and I think that for a large, to a large extent, we tend to uh, exaggerate the impacts mm -hmm. of such events in the content ability to to continue doing business, ability to produce as well, and in particular, export most of the raw materials. I think it's usually lightly exaggerated. Yeah, and that's what we are seeing in a country like India, for example. Yeah. Very interesting. I think one of the drivers for boosting exports, or at least ensuring that your exports are competitive, is obviously your exchange rate. And, you know, we've been seeing the strengthening of the U.S. dollar recently against many currencies. And I'm just wondering how African governments are managing currency depreciation, uh, giving the strengthening in the U.S. dollar. We've seen a lot of volatility across the board, not just here in Nigeria, but in Egypt, in Ghana, and so many other countries. Are the strategies many of these countries pursuing, are they broadly working? working or succeeding? Well, firstly, uh, currency depreciation actually boosts exports, actually makes your exports more attractive. So uh, that may be another reason why exports are tend, will tend to improve in Africa. So, and it There are some countries in the in Asia is artificially devalued because they know that that has a benefit for the exports. Um, but before you do that, you have to ensure that you have the capacity to grow your exports to meet that increased demand that would come when your currencies devalue your exports are more attractive. I, I, I want to say that the challenges that they are having in terms of export, in terms of exchange rate depreciation is not necessarily uh, based on strategy in Africa anyway. It's based on factors that I would say are really out of, uh, it, it's not based on this, necessarily based on depreci depreciating economic fundamentals and the continent you mentioned the strengthening of the u.s dollar which is essentially tied to um the tightening that the u.s has engaged in for, for for several years which has made the u.s dollar more attractive as as people want to hold dollars and it's not because uh, there's been a huge drop in the demand certainly not in the domestic demand of uh, um, of African production or commodities it's just because the u.s is getting stronger and that's impacted them negatively um, and that's why another reason why we are optimistic that in 2024 this would improve because there's a suggestion that sometime down the line uh, this year, later this year, the U.S. might consider uh, relaxing uh, its interest rates. And if that happens, then you have a situation where the dollar is, is not as strong and it becomes a lot easier for African countries to stabilize their exchange rate. At the end of the day, it's not a depreciation, like, like I've said, that's the problem. It's the stability and, I'm, I'm, and that stability is probably one of the biggest challenges that African countries are facing because that stability leads to loosening, uh, it tends to loosen confidence and once that happens, uh, investments also slow down. So creating that stability by having a competitive exchange rate is probably the challenge that they are facing. But like I said, it's not really based on declining uh, fundamentals uh, in many of these countries, just based on more global uh, challenges that are facing that I believe are transferring. Yeah, indeed. And you mentioned you mentioned tightening in the U.S. market around the 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 Fed reserve rate. You know, they obviously have been doing inflation targeting for a while. So I want to talk about you know the prospects for tightening in African markets, if you like, if there's a way to put it, if I could put it that way. But it's really around the the measures uh, governments are embarking on to, ta uh, to tackle inflation. Uh, we had a chart that just showed inflation across some key economies, Nigeria, Angola, Ethiopia, Ghana. You have Egypt where inflation is at 47 percent. I think in Ghana it's at about 24 percent. Um, how successful would you gauge some of these central bank efforts in, in those countries? Well, it's uh, a work in progress based on the numbers you reeled out. I can't actually say that it's been successful, uh, but I can say it's, it, it, it's been, it could be worse. Um, the first objective is to understand what's driving inflation and to institute measures to correct that. So uh, as you are aware, inflation comes from two, two sides, that demand pull or it's, or it's uh, cost push. In most African countries, it's cost push, um, likely as a result of um, their imports um, and because of the depreciation of their currencies, many of these countries, for example, Egypt, it relies heavily on importation of um, wheat, for example. We know wheat prices have gone up in the international market as a result of all this crisis, the Red Sea region, the Russia-Ukraine uh, uh, um, uh, conflict. Uh, so we have two challenges. One, the price of wheat has gone up. At the same time, 
their, their, their reserves have gone down because they're trying to meet all this, uh, um, all this um, import, their revenue has gone down and their reserves have gone down. So this, most of the inflation is coming from imported food commodities in the continent. Uh, and less from excess money supply in most of, of African countries. Again, like I mentioned, these are, in my opinion, issues that are temporary uh, as the global economy begins to adjust. And this has been continued. There's been so many headwinds from COVID to Russia, Ukraine, to now Israel-Palestine uh, conflicts, which are now creating supply bottlenecks. Um, the Red Sea challenges linked to the Israel-Palestinian conflict, increasing cost of moving goods about uh, the place that is affecting African countries significantly is reducing export earnings and is also reducing their foreign reserves, making it difficult to uh, import uh, many of these uh, commodities that they, they get from outside their country that produce domestic. Of course, that's pushing up the prices of uh, is pushing up domestic prices. So it's like the little concerns they have. Like I said, most of them are not really based on significant. Uh, um, fundamentals domestically they're usually but they're mainly based on external challenges and it basically just highlights the importance of african countries to be less dependent externally and more to trade more with themselves internally to increase the percentage of inter-african trade to have a more pan-african development strategy because that's mm -hmm. the way you would minimize the impact from ex external um, uh, issues yeah, indeed. And it, and it seems, uh, you know, a lot of African governments are, are trying to do their best to manage the effects of these economic headwinds. I see Egypt, for instance, where you are, has negotiated some sort of $50 billion rescue package for its economy, given the headwinds there. So we hope there will be some stability uh, restored, at least in the economic uh, climate in the coming months. But I, I wanted to take some time now to talk about Nigeria. Um, of course, there have been two big developments here domestically during the week. Uh, first, the uh, MPC decision, uh, which happened about five days ago, and then subsequently at the end of this week, uh, the bank recapitalization plan. Um, so just brief commentaries on the MPC rate hike. Uh, did that take you by surprise or was it pretty much as you expected? No, it, <laughs> no, I don't think any economic, any serious economic commentator in Nigeria would have felt that was a surprise. I think that uh, at this point, the central bank was left with very few options in terms of policy, and that was the right thing to do. You have, and it tackles several challenges. And Nigeria's inflation of both at this point it is usually driven by costs push issues but now we have a situation where money supply is also in excess and a lot more of the money supply some is feeding into inflation but most of it is feeding into the instability of the exchange rate uh so by pushing up the npr you've you're you are sucking out a lot of the excess cash that is going into the foreign exchange market you are sucking out the extra so money supply that's going into uh in, into prices of goods and, uh, and services at the same time you are also attracting uh foreign capital um so you are reducing that negative real interest rate challenge that it's that is happening and you now get in foreign exchange and if you get in foreign exchange it makes it easy for you to strengthen your ex your exchange rate and keep it more um and make it more stable so with by doing that the cbn i think it was the right move in the right direction they are they are, they are targeted both um the exchange market and they are targeted both um inflation, both imported inflation, excess money supply that might be feeding into domestic um, uh, inflation. So I think it was a move in the right direction. And at the same time, they have, they have, they have started attracting foreign capital. I think you noticed in the last print an increase in reserves and mm. partly has helped in terms of stabilizing the exchange rate. So I think it was moving in the right direction. The only challenge is, is when you introduce one policy, it has implications for others. So uh, it can have implications on growth. It increases cost of funding. So I, at the end of the day, when you're a policymaker, there are all trade-offs. You have to decide what is the most important issue for you. Is it growth? Is it employment? Is it inflation? Uh, and then sequencing, and then decide you do this first for the next. And I think Central Bank has rightly targeted controlling inflation, mm -hmm. which was running away really. Uh, first, and because it has implications on the exchange rate as well, kept the exchange rate stable, um, reducing co cost of inputs, uh, making more foreign exchange uh, available for production. And indirectly, in, in it's going to, over time, start having positive impacts on production and employment. 
Yeah, I, I think, uh, Dr. Khaled, nobody would be under doubt that a key short-term priority for the central bank right now is price stability. So, I mean, I wondered whether you could also maybe give us a, a comment or two on the economic uh, impact of the planned recapitalization of banks. Well, I, I again, that didn't come as a surprise. Uh, it's something that needed to be done. Um, Following the after the last twenty five billion uh, uh, naira capitalization exercise, and this was the, look, we have to understand that uh, financial stability is extremely important, uh, and ensuring that the banks are well capitalized uh, and and minimize the, the risk of default is very important. Now, with a an exchange rate that has depreciated by over two hundred percent, over hundred percent anyway, um, it means that many of those risk ratios that that suggests health of the bank in the banking sector have been uh, debilitated. So you have to increase. You have to increase their. Um, you have to increase their capital to ensure that, based on the international guidelines for um, uh, that makes the financial st uh, sector stable and secure, you're going to have to increase the capital base to move them back in line. So I think it's mostly related to the depreciation of the exchange rate, which has made many of them. Uh, no longer safe in terms of the various um, financial stability indicators. Uh, also, given the direction of government, where the government is saying that they want to grow the economy, double the size of the economy, you can't do it with the current capital base in the banking sector. Um, many major transactions, you see that Nigerian banks still have to, still have to pull seven, eight, ten banks together to be able to fund a major project in Nigeria. That basically just suggests the banks are not capitalized enough to make this. So it's, it again, I think is a move in the right direction. I also like the aspect of the segmentation, breaking them into different uh, levels of banking so that you don't have this one rule fits all system that that I don't, be, I've never believed was appropriate. So I think again, I think the great decision by the central bank. Yeah, thank you very much for those comments on Nigeria. I, I want to come back to an issue that has been plaguing the continent for quite a few years, which is debt sustainability. Uh, we've seen quite a lot of countries move to renegotiate their facilities with bilateral external creditors, multilateral creditors across board. Uh, this debt overhang, what impact is it going to have on the outlook for many African countries? Ghana, for instance, has just secured a $5.4 billion renegotiation package, well, around its $5.4 billion debt. And many other countries, Zambia has spent the last three years negotiating its debt uh, restructuring. How is this going to impact the otherwise relatively positive economic growth outlook for, for the continent this year? Well, first of all, uh, I think we have to be careful in terms of narrative. It's not many, it's three or four of them mm -hmm. that have defaulted in their loans. The rest of them are actually making their payments with a bit of strain, but their payments have been made as and when due. Um, so, I mean, I don't think when we have, a, when you have 54 countries on the continent um, suggesting that because four, three or four of them have um, had to renegotiate, I think it's Ghana, Ethiopia, um, there's, there's one other one, the Zambia, and there's one other one. Um, I think I don't think because three or four of them have had to renegotiate, that comes um, that should be that should be we should conclude that that's a systemic crisis that's gone across all the countries. The three main economies have, don't have a problem for now. That's Egypt, Nigeria, Egypt, and South Africa, and those three are accounting for forty percent of the entire African region. Uh, so when you have a situation where three or four countries in Africa of fifty four are having challenged their debt, I don't think we should just put a I make a general statement that the African continent, most of them, many of them, I think that class qualifies as many. However, um, quite a few of them are having, are paying their debts, but with a bit of difficulty. And again, like I said, that difficulty is based on challenges they are facing in their, with, with their traditional markets in Europe, where demand in those countries have gone down. In, in growth is slowing down in China. It's, it's virtually almost zero. It's zero in Europe. Uh, and the U.S., even though the U.S. is growing strongly now, it has it was slowing down for a while. So that is what is impacting demand for their goods and services, mostly raw materials for inputs. Like I said, if they slow down in manufacturing for in uh, in in in, the, in in Europe or in the in the U.S., there will be demand less of Nigerian inputs, and yeah. of course that affects their ability to generate uh, revenue. So that's, that's uh, what is happening. I won't say. There's a challenge with sustainability per se. I would say that they are facing challenges with paying their debt. But so far, um, they are still managing to pay those debts. Many of them are 
are, are, are raising money quite successfully. A few of them have raised money quite successfully. We suggest that the general outlook for many of these countries is very, very positive. Um, and the growth numbers we've seen suggest that things are going to be much better this year than last year. So if they were able to survive last year when they were growing slower, when the global economy was more constrained, I don't see any reason why we should mm. be concerned this year when expectations are for stronger growth, uh, which will make it easier, a big a, a increase in exports, um, which will make it easier for them to pay their, their debt. Yeah. I have to add here that, I have to add here very quickly that it's, again, this flags the importance. Uh, I'm talking about that um, dependency on the development model and growth and development that depends on uh, their exports being um being demanded by more advanced countries and this is the reason why in trafficking trade has is not as, as as strong as it should be and it's because most of what we produce for exports in the continent are raw materials that will not be demanded by other African countries because, uh, for example, if a country produces lithium, in Nigeria will not demand lithium because we don't have the industry that uh, requires that raw material. So if we can focus on industrializing the continent and spending more of its resources, which are in the ground, most people advise that African countries should leave their resources in the ground, and only take them out uh, very little at a time. Uh, and I think that's the wrong model. I think many countries that are not follow that development model. They have used their raw materials, pulled yeah. them out of the ground, exported them, raised the revenue, developed their economies in, in, in a strategic way, have actually grown and developed very well. And I think that's something that we need to change. We need to come up with a new African-based development model that uses economies and that generates uh, for change and then enables us to industrialize the continent. And then also in the process, um, it makes us trade more with ourselves so that if Nigeria needs to purchase televisions or iPads, for example, is being produced in Ghana. So we just have to go yeah. to Ghana and buy. In which case, whatever is happening in the global economy will not affect Africa because we are trading with ourselves more. But because mm. we are trading in all these other economies that have the conflict, it affects our ability to generate our revenue. So I think it's all a case of changing our long-term development model. I think that's the way to go for the continent. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Callen. I'm glad you you mentioned you brought some balance to the debt uh, sustainability discussion. Just to point out, there was no mention of debt default in, in that commentary and question. And you, of course, you did highlight what I also highlight at the top of the show around the appetite for sovereign debt, which still remains very robust across the African continent. And of course, you ended with the need for greater intra-African trade, which I think will certainly help us boost our productivity and our output on the continent. Dr. Kale, it's always very great speaking to you, whether on panels or on the screen. Thank you for joining us live from Cairo, Dr. Yemi Kale, Chief Economist and Managing Director at Afrexing Bank. Thanks for joining us.